Good day, everyone. Live from Cloud City, Seattle, this is This Just In. Uh, I'm Justin, and this is the Microsoft Reactor Show for What Is New. Uh, just a reminder today, of course, I know for those of you who have visited before, we have a code of conduct. Be respectful, be nice, be polite, but most importantly, uh, share your perspective. Uh, these are meant to be interactive sessions, even though we are streaming on Learn TV and Twitch and YouTube. Uh, so log into your favorite chat platform. Be sure to ask us questions. Uh, and particularly today, uh, this is a very interactive session because we are covering Teach Yourself and Your Family and Friends How to Code. Uh, and I have an awesome guest today who has been doing that for some time. Uh, welcome, Jacqueline. Thanks, Justin. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Yes, thank you, Jacqueline. And we're going to focus on different tools and education technology that you can use uh, to learn to code, whether you are an aspiring engineer and a software engineer, or uh, you're just trying to pick something up and learn something new, or maybe you are a business leader or a medical professional or a student or just getting started. And so uh, we have a set of uh, tools of learning to code uh, for you. Uh, but before we go into some of that and Jacqueline demos a little bit later in our stream, uh, Jacqueline, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your professional background and uh, get to know you a little bit more? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so I am a, a program manager at Microsoft. I've been with Microsoft for a long time now. Um, and I think it's like 16 years or something. Um, and um, I work in our developer division, which is the organization that builds all of our platforms and tooling for uh, for developers. So like Visual Studio, VS Code, all of uh, .NET, all of that. Um, and we, I sit on a little team in that organization that's focused on education. So aspiring developers or future developers. Um, and, uh, and the primary product that I work on is a product called Microsoft Make Code, uh, which targets middle school and high school um, kids learning to program. Um, and prior to this role, I, you know, I've been, I've been at Microsoft for a while, um, but um, all the teams that I've worked on within Microsoft have been focused on um, education and technology and the intersection between those two. Um, just that's been a passion of mine for for a while. Um, so I've worked um, I've worked in, on the Minecraft team. So when we rolled out Minecraft Education Edition, uh, I've worked on in our hardware group. So uh, working on Surface for Education, um, and then uh, then also working as a, a developer platform evangelist um, focused on academic students. So higher education students and faculty. Um, and let's see what else. So I, I graduated with a CS degree, didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I did some IT consulting for a while, kind of traveling around and um, working on different projects. Um, and then decided, you know, hey, I think I wanted to um, go back to school. And so I went back to school and got a business degree, came to Microsoft and kind of um, just found myself in love with the academic audience and working with students and teachers. Yeah, very, very cool. I can honestly say sincerely, Jacqueline, I think you have one of the coolest jobs in all of Microsoft, <laughs> being able to, you know, you, you, you sit in the engineering and developer division, so you get exposure to all of the tools that we build for software engineers and developers around the world. Um, but you have this unique ability to kind of take that and distill that down to the more simple components to really introduce concepts and really teach people uh, sequentially from you know computational logic. Uh, we're going to show a little bit of that a little bit later. Uh, but then also what's really cool about some of the things that Jacqueline and the team have built here uh, is that then you can toggle to the actual code, uh, whether it be JavaScript or Python or things like that. And so um, I can say for myself, I didn't come from a CS background. I am a non-traditional uh, engineer. I uh, became a hobbyist web developer and through a lot of on-the-job training and skilling and boot camps and things like that, learned uh, to code myself. To some degree, um, I am one of those learners that um, would have benefited tremendously by like a make code uh, back in the day. Um, you know, in my case, I picked up a book on Pascal and later web development and taught myself from the ground up. It was a little harder, uh, but those were those were earlier days. Um, 
and things like that too. Yeah, Pascal, that was my first language. Uh huh. Yeah. So I, yeah. I don't know why I picked up Pascal. I think it was just the first book that I saw that was a programming language. But I, I, I definitely think the magic moment for me was when I started with web development. The idea that mm -hmm. you could bring an image onto a web page, and so. Um, I'd be using Photoshop. I was kind of a hobbyist designer. That's actually where I like the artistic and element of it got me excited early on. And so web development became that kind of magic moment of coding for me. Um, I know some of you out there might say, I don't know if HTML is coding, but back then for me learning, it totally was like this idea of writing something and things like that. JavaScript would come later in the web browser and stuff like that, of course, but um, good stuff. So. Jacqueline, what was your first experience with coding or what inspired you there? Yeah, so I didn't have a CS uh, class in high school. Um, okay. So, and actually even today, um, only half of high schools in the US offer any computer mm -hmm. science courses. Um, and certainly back then, you know, my high school didn't have, we had like word processing, right? That was the, <laughs> that was the extent of it. So, um, so my first experience with computer science was in um, college, and um, in college, freshman year, I was going to be a math major, and at the time, the math department was co-located with the CS department in the same building, mm -hmm. and I remember sitting in um, a math class, and I don't even remember what math class it was, but we were doing like these really boring, like proving theorems, like, you know, take the whole chalkboard and I was just like so bored out of my mind and I looked through the you know on the door to these classrooms there's like a window I looked through the window at, across the hall to the class that was there and they were like I couldn't tell what they were doing but they had like these lights and wires and they were wiring things up and there was like lots of movement and it just looked so much fun so after that class I went over to the uh, uh, to the other classroom and was like, hey, what um, what class is this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah, it, it was an intro CS class. They were um, they were building breadboarding some uh, very you know rudimentary calculators mm -hmm. with like, LED lights and stuff. And uh, I was like, wow, this looks like so much fun. I'm going to sign up for this class. And um, since then, you know, I, it's just, it was, um, it was amazing for me to find something that was um, both very theoretical and abstract, but also very practical. And like, you could actually build real stuff with it. And like the programs that you build, other people could use. And uh, yeah, it was just, it was wonderful for me. So, uh, so that was my first experience with, with computer science it wasn't until freshman year in college. Um, but yeah, that, well, what was yours? Yours was like web development? Yeah, so it was web development and design for me and the idea that I could express myself, um, you know, publicly or personally on this idea of a web page. Uh, mm -hmm. So I had my, uh, before there was Facebook, before there was MySpace, uh, you actually could build your own website. You still can for that matter, but you mm -hmm. could put your own website out there. And I think I had a um, I don't know, a gobbledygook of a URL. I don't even remember it. I definitely did not <laughs> buy justin.com or justin.org or something like that uh, that had been taken. But, you know, my other magic moment uh, were, were video games and specifically uh, 2D, uh, what we kind of know now as like sprite based games, right? Where you have, again, this is the designer in me, but I love the idea of creating these sort of pixelated characters uh, that were simplified. Um, and so then I started to learn. Uh, the concepts of the math behind that and collision detection and being able to manipulate an animating character. Like, so if Super Mario is running across the screen, uh, you know, his leg moves this way and this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. And if you animate that very quickly, same concepts in like the movies and animation, um, you can eventually create a game. In fact, we're going to talk about that a little again later on this stream too. But yeah. that was my magic moment. It really was uh, to see the way computer graphics could come to life. Uh, my very first game was Oregon Trail, for those of you who might know that one or, or might have experienced that uh, early on as well. Yeah, my that, in that same intro level class, my first sort of real program was um, was in Pascal. It was like an ASCII hangman game mm -hmm. where you had to like guess the word. Yeah, yeah, super cool. 
All right, well, let's bridge to a little bit more of putting uh, coding in context. Um, Jacqueline, you and I have talked a lot. We've worked together uh, through our academic, our student initiatives and things like that. Um, I think you really provide a great perspective on why coding is important. And so regardless of who you are out there who might be watching this stream, whether you're an educator or a student or professional, um, Jacqueline, can you share with us a little bit why it's so important to learn this as a core skill? Yeah, it's, I mean, I think we can all agree that the purpose of education is to prepare students, you know, for college, career, citizenship, right? Um, and, um, and I think, I mean, th there's a really great quote. I, th I think I put it on the slide, one of the slides I sent you, but, um, but it was from Malcolm X. And he says that the education is a passport to the future. Tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today, right? And so if you look at our world, we like live in a time of just increasing technological change, right? We've got rapidly evolving economy, um, all sorts of new technologies coming out. Um, and frankly, you know, the labor market has not kept up, right? Mm -hmm. um, and on this slide, so I looked, I looked this up, you know, the, what are the jobs going to be, you know, in the future, right? And this was a few of the, the job listings that um, I pulled this from a specific uh, analyst um, who predicted for the year 2030. And you can see like some of them are things like this augmented reality journey builder. So designing virtual reality experiences, mm -hmm. right? For retail or others. Um, AI healthcare technician, you know, these jobs exist today actually, um, but this is like using artificial intelligence to, to diagnose and treat patients. Um, smart city analysts, so analyzing data from IoT sensors placed around urban areas, you know, and then transport controller, you know, for this brave new world of automated vehicles and drones that we're moving, you know, into. So, mm -hmm. and, and this is just a taste, right? Like all of these jobs do require deep levels of comfort and understanding of technology. And, and these aren't like the computer science techie jobs. These are going to be like normal everyday jobs for people. Um, and, you know, so, so when we think about like how Microsoft can play a role in this future, it's really about, you know, teaching and learning, you know, for everyone about technology. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we want everyone to be able to participate in the digital economy of tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. And like one of the terms as I was I was working with educators or other faculty through the job role I've had over the last few years, um, the term computational literacy tends to come out uh, pretty often. Uh, for those who may maybe not familiar with that, computational literacy is, and I'll paraphrase here, I'm sure there's much more eloquent definitions, but you know, to be able to the, the the ability to be able to understand how computers work and how to think systematically, um, and as you kind of described, Jacqueline, with some of these job roles, to be familiar enough with our systems, uh, you may not be the person who becomes a dedicated software engineer tomorrow, but to have literacy, to have an understanding, basically of coding, of the way computers work, the way data uh, relates to each other, is super super important for the job skills of tomorrow. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Like we don't, you know, we don't expect everyone to be computer scientists, right? But um, but unless we like equip everyone with these basic computational, you know, thinking and literacy skills, then we're creating this divide between sort of the, you know, almost like the second digital divide between people who feel in control of the technology and world around them and can mm -hmm. you know manipulate it to a certain extent and and then those who don't right those who are kind of at the mercy of of technology and so we want to make sure that we're you know we're not creating this you know polarization yeah yeah and you speak to that second uh, the the first being uh, having internet connectivity being able to yes, um, yeah. you know i think the the first step as i think of as a person who's been dedicated to education and, and teaching this too is you know step one for many people is to get that sort of reliable internet access and the uh, ability to see uh, the world through technology and then secondarily the familiarity building those types of literacy type skills uh, there as well 
Um, fortunately, there are so many resources out there, and certainly, um, you know, if you're out there, Microsoft has many. Most of our stuff is free, of course, for learning coding and teaching and things like that uh, as well. But but not just Microsoft. There are so many resources out there. I just encourage you to check out the whole range of different things uh, that you can learn uh, as well. Well, Jacqueline, the other question I wanted to ask before we kind of get even to more what's new and into the kind of the practical element of it is um, I kind of want to debunk a myth or or speak to uh, maybe those people that are out there are a little uncomfortable about learning to code. You know, maybe they perceive that, uh, you know, you have to have a college degree or that you need to have a lot of math or things like that. And, and so what would you say to a person out there that's just feeling a little uncomfortable about trying this based on some of their perceptions? Yeah, I think that's, you know, it's too bad that that CS has this perception that it's like super hard or it's really, you know, only for like the nerdy kids or something like that. I mean, I think I I certainly am a great example of like someone who, you know, uh, was successful and enjoyed computer science, um, but, you know, didn't certainly didn't consider myself super smart or, you know, uh, one of these su super gifted kids. I think. Um, Look, the tools today to teach CS are have come so far, right? Like I remember when I was learning, we had to spend you had to spend like 10 minutes just setting up your environment um, before you could write a single line of code. And then it was just like a print screen <laughs> statement, right? Versus now, you know, there's so many online in browser tools where and you know the entry point for coding it isn't like some cryptic command line, but really, you know, it's a visual, colorful drag and drop environment um, for for kids to learn and to start gaining confidence in computer science. Um, I always say, like, if you can drag and drop, you can code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yes, yeah, so it's become a lot more approachable. I think on the perception side, there's still a lot we can do to sort of debunk a lot of these perception issues or sort of the um, a lot of the baggage that computer science has, um, certainly at the middle school and high school levels. Um, and I think a lot of that is just role modeling, like making sure that, you know, we have teachers who are women who are, you know, black or Latino, right? Like that mm -hmm. we have, you know, role models for for these kids to aspire to. Um, and so I think I I think you're right. I think this the perception issues around computer science is is something that is a challenge and that we we absolutely need to work work toward. Yeah, yeah and I, I think of it as um, not only a challenge, if you look at some of the numbers on this slide, we have this incredible opportunity, 31% growth of software development in the next five years, give or take a little bit. Uh, but yet uh, we're missing so much uh, representation of uh, all people and participating in uh, software development. So there is absolute upside and opportunity to grow and improve here. Um, and I think one of the things we can do there is to make the barriers to entry easier, learning to code, learning to be able to drag and drop and just experiment and learn. Um, I'll even you know share a story of my 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 daughter uh, yesterday, and I didn't even ask her about this, but I was like, hey, honey, what you what you doing? Uh, she was just up in her room with her her laptop, and she goes, oh, I've just been trying to I've been trying to you know experiment with some logic here and trying to get a song to work. She was she was composing a little tune with code blocks, um, and in just the fact that she was organically drawn to that. I did not ask her. I didn't suggest that she do it. She just discovered it on her own. And so I, I think about like, how do we create a million moments like that? Because um, if we do, uh, I believe that these numbers here can get, you know, a lot better and, and represent more um, all people in that. Jacqueline, were there any barriers that you encountered in, in route to learning to, to code and become an engineer as well? Um, you know, honestly, not too much. I had super supportive faculty um, and professors in college and my peers were, um, you know, very helpful. And like we we all felt like we were going through this together. So um, so I didn't personally um, experience a lot of the 
um, you know, institutional barriers that I know um, a lot other, of others have experienced um, when, you know, learning CS. So, um, so yeah, so that's what, and there are a lot of barriers, certainly the perception issues, you know, where kids aren't even choosing to, you know, to explore computing um, in middle school or high school. But then even, you know, in higher education and in college, you know, we see huge uh, ratios of dropout rates for underrepresented student populations. Um, and so there's a lot more we could be doing to mm -hmm. foster this sort of sense of belongingness and this feeling that, you know, uh, you can get help, that you are welcome in, in computer science. So, yeah. And, and I think what I hear you also saying there is that you had a community to support you, that you were, you were, yeah. you were in it together, right? You were learning, you were learning together. And so you, you and others, you sought each other out and supported each other, which, uh, you know, uh, let's face it, learning, learning to code, learning to become an engineer can be challenging at times. And so having people to go on that journey is so important. And so um, that's one of the things, you know, this Microsoft Reactor community is about. Uh, we want all people to participate there. Uh, but I also encourage you all out there to find your local communities, uh, people who want to learn to code, who want to uh, be in community with each other. Um, there are great resources on great resources online, uh, but you can only do so much just online by yourself. It's just so important to, to seek other people out um, in that. That's so that true. Well. Yeah. Cool. Well, let me ask uh, you, you know, how has learning to code changed? Uh, you know, what are some of the things that you look forward to in the coming years that I think we still need to accomplish in order to make it easier for people to learn? Yeah, certainly. So um, with Make Code, what we're seeing um, and sort of maybe I'll give you a little bit of a history of this project um, is, you know, the this, this pipeline of um, kids learning uh, computational thinking and literacy is, like I said, sort of drying up quite early um, in mo middle school and high school, where a lot of um, students are sort of opting out um, of that track and never taking another CS class in their lives, right? Um, and so um, our vision for, for this product is really to inspire new generations of technology creators. Um, and we we do that by trying to make computer science fun, right? And interesting and relevant to all students. Um, and uh, and so we we're trying to integrate more computing education into the core curriculum because, as we know, computer science isn't mandated. Um, it's not part of uh, a requirement to graduate um, in high school. Um, and we're, trying to, you know, also make it more fun and engaging for students who, you know, might want to try it even outside of the classroom. Um, and so you're, uh, you're just showing on this slide um, a picture of our um, homepage. So if, if you want to learn more about MakeCode, you can just go to makecode.com. Um, and we have three main editors that you see here. So um, one is Make Code Arcade, which is um, a game development environment which allows kids to make um, retro style arcade games, um, like 2D sprite based games. Um, and then this middle one here is um, uh, Coding the Microbit, which is a physical computing device. Um, you can think of it as kind of a simpler version of Arduino. Um, where all the sensors and everything is built in to the device. So there's no need to, you know, wire a breadboard. Um, and, uh, and, you know, you can code right in the browser and then download your programs onto, onto this physical device. And then you can make all sorts of things like, um, you know, door alarms or uh, moisture sensors for, mm -hmm. you know, plants and stuff like that. So... And then the third main code editor is uh, is in Minecraft. So um, this is in the Minecraft uh, Education Edition game. You can bring up a coding window and code mods and things in in the Minecraft game. Yep, super cool. Um, well, let's um, let's bridge into that demo component of it, uh, Jacqueline. I, I think people would love to kind of see Make Code in action. And so I'll I'll kind of set the stage as 
um, you know, I am a new learner. I am uh, 14 years old. I'm thinking about uh, exploring coding for the first time. I might have heard from a mentor or an educator uh, that this was a cool thing to, to try. I might have a little exposure with video games because they're so prevalent right now, whether you're on a mobile phone or your preferred gaming platform. And so I'm that, make, that aspiring make code user. Where, where do I begin, Jacqueline? That's great. Um, so I can show you, I, I'll show you two of my our, our code editors. I'll show you the microbit and then um, Arcade. Uh, cool. So let me, uh, should I go ahead and share my screen? Yep, you can uh, click share screen and then we'll we'll add it to the stream here. Okay. Let me know when you can see my screen. All right, I'm adding it to the stream. Now we can see it. Oh, great. All right. So as mentioned again, this is our um, main, main page. Uh, you can easily get to our three main code editors from here. Um, and then there's also some case studies of teachers using MakeCode in the classroom, um, some resources, and then some other code editors that, um, that we support as well, um, but aren't our three main code editors. So um, maybe I'll start with the micro bit. Um, so, as I mentioned again, the microbit is um, a uh, little device, um, and I, maybe I'll just show you on the screen. Can you see this microbit on the camera? Super cool. Yeah. This is my favorite device. It's so easy to pick up, and uh, yeah, what you're yeah. here, Jacqueline, is you don't have to have a microbit yourself. You can also use the simulator, right? This is true. Yes, yeah. this is yeah. absolutely true. So, on the microbit page, um, we've got a bunch of you know, step-by-step -step tutorials um, for building little gadgets and creations. There is um, videos on how to bake, build different projects. Um, and then there's also some um, courses down here. So if you are an educator uh, and you're interested in incorporating the microbit into your curriculum, uh, you can look at some pre-made courses that are available uh, here with the microbit. Uh, and then there's some other videos about science experiments and hardware and whatnot. So, um, so lots of lots of resources on this first home page. But maybe let me just do a demo of the environment, um, just to kind of show you what it's like. So I'll just create a project, um, and you can see on the left side um, when it loads is the microbit simulator. So that's just what you were talking about, Justin. Mm -hmm. um, you do not have to have an actual hardware device. Um, you can actually code against this simulator as well. And in the middle here, you can see I've got um, a menu of different coding blocks that I can use in my, uh, in my program. And on the right side is my workspace, and this is where we are gonna, going to build our program. And at the top, you can see I can actually toggle between blocks and JavaScript. So, um, and I can code, and, and or Python. We also support Python yep. programming. That's language. super cool. Python's very popular right now. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so if I, you know, I can, it, we ha we're like one of the very um, uh, first code editors that can, you know, do programming in both, you know, um, text and blocks and do that kind of two-way um to a um, compilation mm -hmm. between yep. uh, between blocks and so any edits you make in the code will will reflect here in blocks and vice versa. So um, so yeah so there's um, there's a lot of different sensors on the microbit. Um, there is buttons that you can program against. There's an accelerometer, so you can uh, program events like if I shake the microbit, maybe I'll play some music. And um, to your point, Justin, um, I have seen kids uh, spend upwards of an hour just programming different tunes on their microbit. Mm -hmm. um, I, I am no um, uh, musician, so <laughs> so I, you know I I have no idea what I'm coding right now, but. <laughs> <laughs> but certainly you can string together tones like this. And so uh, when I shake the micro bit, um, yeah, you can. <laughs> not, not bad, Jacqueline, for a live demo. Not not. <laughs> we also have, you know, for, for those of us who may um, 
who may have um, a, a challenge stringing together notes separately, we do have this play melody um, block, which will allow kids to, you know, program uh, different melodies, you know, and, and change the tempos and things like that. Um, so, uh, so that's another option when, you know, using, when using uh, music, yeah. Um, but, but as I mentioned before, there's lots of different things you can do with the micro bit, um, that's includes, you know, the sound, but also radio. So there's a Bluetooth antenna on this device. And so there's a lot of radio games that you can, um, play where, you know, you send messages between different micro bits. Um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, so there's. And then when you're done programming your, you know, whatever program you want to create, um, you can simply download from the web browser. Um, and actually, we do support, we also support uh, web USB. Mm -hmm. So I could pair my, uh, my device and, um, you know, to my browser. So I can, I've got the micro bit plugged into my computer. I can pair it to my browser. Um, and then I can just, you know, simply download from here. Um, and then when you plug in your micro bit, um, oops, when you plug in your micro bit, you can, um, you know, you can see it here as a, as a, um, web USB drive. And so that's where you're going to be, um, that's where you're going to be downloading your, um, your program. So I don't know, I don't know. Can you hear my micro bit now? Yeah, I, I could hear a little bit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's downloading, it's downloading onto it now. You can kind of see the, the light on the back here flashing. So that's mm -hmm. like yeah. downloading my program. Um, and these are, so there's two versions of the micro bit. There's a original version, and then there's this, um, this version they came out with um, in 2020. Um, and this one is, has a speaker and microphone, which is really nice. Wow. Um, but very similar. So if I shake it you can hear the i don't know if you can hear that can you yeah hear? no that's the accelerometer very yeah, cool that's the accelerometer, and then i press button a you can very hear it and jacqueline if you don't mind would you toggle to the code on any either like javascript or python there oh, so that sure. yeah can, yeah see now now you have all these different um you know different functions basically that are, are playing or, or doing when they, an event is activated in this case that's right yeah and we do have affordances for kids just mm. learning to program right so i think i showed you the intellisense um capability so this is actually we, we actually use a uh, monaco which is the you know mm -hmm. the code editor that powers vs code so you can see we've got some nice intellisense here um uh, then an encode completion. Um, and then we also have, um, uh, you know, error detection. So, oh, there's a problem. Um, right. So yeah, very nice. Yeah. Um, and then we also have, you'll notice we still have the toolbox here. Um, but instead of, um, you know, blocks of code, you can see we've got these little kind of API descriptors. <laughs> so, you know, you can see, oh, okay, this is what this um does um and then you can also you know pull these out pull these little code snippets out into the editor so this mm -hmm. is also helpful for kids who are just learning text-based coding and need you know a little bit more guidance um as they're as they're doing this yeah it's a really great stair step because you can build what you expect from a logical perspective with the blocks but then toggle back and forth and with IntelliSense here then you can start to get what a real code editor feels like if you were to go download VS Code or pull in an extension, mm -hmm. things like that as well. Um, even some of the libraries that are here, you know, music.beat, for example. So the code right. is categorized in such a way uh, that's very consistent with, say, pulling in other libraries and code um, in, in libraries as well, you know. Yeah, we we try to make it um, much easier just because we know that there is a little bit of a cliff between block based coding and sort of, you know, the text based real world programming. And so we're trying to make it as easy as possible for kids to kind of 
cross that divide, you know, they, and we know that, you know, kids don't just wake up overnight and be like, Oh, I'm a, I'm a text-based coder now. Right. So, so we, and we want to, you know, be able for, to, to support them as they sort of make this gradual transition. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the other thing, just maybe to connect back to some other This Just In episodes, uh, in the previous episode, we uh, covered what's new in the maker community and talked to Stacey Mulcathy. And one of the things that she shared with us is there's a whole range of different uh, devices like the micro bit. There's Circuit Print Playground, which is almost like a fashion statement. You can wear it around your neck or tie it uh, and have like little um, you know, emojis and things like that. But uh, there's so much you can do with this. Um, I once had the opportunity to be part of, uh, what was it, Q, that's the little robot where you can program the robot, robot to go forward and back. But um, there is so much to do here um, and not just for kids. I've enjoyed it as an adult uh, as well. Um, it just feels so approachable um, in learning something new there uh, yeah. as well. Very cool. Yeah, and we've done a lot of research around physical computing um, and it, it really has like one of the research projects that we did in partnership with the BBC was um, when the microbit first came out, they distributed um, a million of these devices uh, across the UK. Uh, and they did pre and post um, surveys to understand, you know, what was the impact of, you know, students learning, uh, learning on the microbit. And they found one of the findings, well, they came up with a lot of really great, powerful uh, findings. But one of them was um, when they surveyed girls specifically, they found mm -hmm. that there was a 70% in increase in interest among girls to continue studying computer science and to take an another programming course after having been exposed to the microbit. So there's mm -hmm. something really, really tangible or really kind of um, interesting for students to actually code a physical device and actually build something with their hands um, that, you know, interests a broader range of students than just, yeah. you know, coding something on the screen. Yeah, I agree. And hands on for me, like I said earlier, video games were really a key component of that and learning the concept of collision detection and sprite-based uh, um, sprite-based animations and things like that. Uh, so, Jacqueline, would you would you show us uh, Make Code Arcade too? Because we're totally going to cover my two favorite, Microbit and Make Code Arcade. <laughs> those, are, those are the ones that I think are just so <laughs> enjoyable. Okay, of yeah. course, Minecraft is awesome. Y'all love yeah. Minecraft, but you know. Yes. So, uh, so Make Code Arcade, as I mentioned before, is our game development environment that's entirely in the web. So. Nothing to download and install. And I should mention that MakeCode is all open source, too. So um, all of our code editors are. Um, you mentioned, you know, if for students who um, may not be taking a computer science class but still want to learn on their own, we have something called these skill maps and, you know, and tutorials. Um, but these are really ways for students to just follow a progression path on their own. Uh, to learn to program. So, and these are just like little, min each one of these little nodes is like a little mini tutorial, um, you know, where you follow the directions um, and you, you know, um, uh, you can, you know, code your game. Um, and, and, you know, then we have like a little, um, a little trophy at the end, you know, for the kids, they can earn a little badge. Um, you know, for completing it. Um, and, and so these are nice, these skill maps and tutorials are a nice way for students who, like I said, may not have a teacher telling them, you know, what to do uh, or, or what to learn, but still want to, you know, go through and learn how to code a game. Um, so, so that's what I would say about, um, about that mm -hmm. in terms of support for students learning on their own. Um, and then again, we do have videos, um, you know, teaching kids how to code. We've got some sample games here. Um, oh, our, our live stream. So we do a, um, a, a daily live stream Monday through Friday, uh, 1 p.m. Pacific, where um, our team just codes a game. So students can tune in and kind of see, see our engineers building games. <laughs> And then we've got a ton of community games that that people have published and shared with us as well. Um, 
and then uh, and then courses again for teachers who are teaching uh, with with Make Code Arcade in the classroom. We just came out last year with an um, advanced placement computer science principles course um, that has been super popular. Um, and then and then hardware. So we don't you know you don't have to ha purchase hardware to work with Make Code Arcade, but certainly. Um, this is something that is super engaging for kids, and they love to see when they can actually download their games that they create onto these little handheld game devices uh, and share with their friends. So that's right. I forgot about Meowbit. We uh, we used that uh, three or four years ago in in one of our our student events. I forgot about that one, Jacqueline. That's, yeah. that's super fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of times, like students say, like that it makes them feel like their game is more real. Yeah. Like they can download it onto an actual little, you know, handheld game device and like show their friends or their, you know, parents or whatever. It's like, this is the game I created. Yeah, it, it's that magic moment where like, wow, I could be a video game programmer because yeah. my code could actually end up on this physical device. I, I think it comes back to that research uh, that you and and mm -hmm. others were were doing is that that tangibility is so important when you're establishing kind of early um, early learning, especially for people who are you know kids or for students and things like that um, as right. well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually have a question from Learn TV that's uh, related to right. this. I might ask you, Jacqueline. Uh, I presumably this comes from a volunteer STEM. Uh, person or an educator, but the question is, do you have any IDEs created by Microsoft that are networked so that educators can supervise students and help them code? We don't. So th I think this is sort of more of, uh, along the lines of like, what are the classroom management tools available for teachers mm -hmm. using this in the classroom? So I would say a couple things. One is we have a really nice Teams integration um, component. So I'll, I'll just pull up the blog post about this. So we built this a couple of years ago, but um, uh, let me see if I can find where that is. Yeah, make code assignments in Teams. So if you are an educator using Teams in the classroom, we have a nice integration where, um, and if you watch this video, I'm not going to I'll play this right now, but uh, where essentially you can create assignments um, and then attach make code resource files into those assignments and then, you know, collect the assignments from your students. So that's one way that you can do uh, use teams to, to do these kind of um, essentially support the, a classroom workflow. The other one I would say um, that we don't build, but um, but that our friends over at the Microbit Foundation builds is something called Classroom. Um, oh, let's see. Um, I thought it was at Classroom, maybe. Um, but but if you look, maybe you do a search for it. Um, um, but if you look here, let's see if they have a link to it. Um, here we go, My, Microbit Classroom. So this is a very lightweight um, web-based tool um, where you can set up your classroom. So my project, um, you can use Make Code here, um, and then um, and then give your students a code essentially, um, and then they join the classroom, and then um, and then you can see like their work. So similar to the Teams kind of assignment workflow um but that but you can actually see their you know their make code um work that they're doing yeah very yeah, cool very so yeah <laughs> and i think even if you aren't able to network uh as an educator and see uh, different students learning journeys one of the nice things i i personally found in having taught some classes with make code and things like that is at least you know the predictability that the tutorial is helping step a student through from start to finish so that if you're in an in-person environment, you can walk around and you kind of know exactly where each student kind of is in the process. And there's some good, I think, kind of bookends on, on helping that student progress through the assignment. Um, and the other thing I think I would also say is just the interoperability about it. It doesn't really matter what device you access on because this is a web-based uh, application. So uh, I know that different educational orgs have different devices out there. And so this makes, we believe that 
you know, a web a web browser is a, one of the easiest ways to go and, and access that, you know, as well. Yeah, and the other thing I would say is many um, schools and teachers have um, their own LMS systems, and so what what you can do is have your students like submit snapshots of their work in time. So, for example, if I'm working on a game here, I can click the share button up here mm -hmm. and publish yep. this game, um, and then I'll co you know I could copy and paste this URL into you know, my assignment submission, um, just to show progress of what I've been doing thus far. And that will, sh that will give you kind of a snapshot in time of your game. So if I was to just click that, I don't, I'm not sure if there's no chat here, but, um, so this would just show you sort of the game that I'm creating right now, which is just a pink, pink background. Yeah. But if I was to add something else, so say I was to add a, a sprite to this and continue working on my game here, um, uh, then I can also, I can share again, and this will create kind of a new snapshot in time of my progress that I could submit again through that, you know, whatever learning management system that, um, you may be using. So you can get these sort of, um, you know, ways to see what, you know, how your students are progressing just through this, you know, shared URL, um, capability that we support. So... Yep, that's that's important because then now a student could demonstrate. Say you take three screenshots, you know, the first chapter one, chapter two, build the sprite, chapter three, animate, or things like mm -hmm. that you know, uh, to try to fulfill on the learning objective or or lead to assessment in some way. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Awesome. So, um, yeah. No, go, so no, go ahead. Gonna... Yeah. What, what else would you like to share on arcade? There's so much we could do here. Like we could do a whole hour long stream, and you do. Uh, probably uh, I guess on this alone. So yeah, what, what do yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, I guess here? I would. I would just say, you know, we like to. We designed arcade to be the easiest way to build a game. So mm -hmm. you know, there are some nice things about the constraints of a two D environment, and you know, the, a screen that's one hundred and sixty pixels wide by one hundred and twenty pixels high. You know, <laughs> it is nice because you know you don't have to be like um a um a math or a physics whiz or like know how to do 3d you know object shading and things like that to build a really fun compelling game um and so with just a few blocks of code so here i've set my background color i've created a sprite you know i want to be able to move my sprite around the screen so i use you know one block to do that and then you know i can i can move my sprite around the screen um I can create, so say I want to create some um, objects for my deck to collect. So this on-game update um, will run every, you know, 500 milliseconds or every one second, say. Um, and I can, you know, I can create, um, I don't know, what do, what do ducks eat? <laughs> Does anyone uh, know? <laughs> I, I don't know. What do ducks eat? Um, well, let's bugs, see. Bugs on the water. <laughs> oh, bu oh, bugs. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I'll I'll draw like a little bug. Okay, I'm okay. Now you're I, seeing. <laughs> I I love building sprites this way. You know. Yeah. So this is this is my little bug maybe. Um, and it's oops. Yeah. Uh, let's do undo. Um, maybe it's got some wings. Um, maybe it's like a fly. Is this a fly? Maybe. <laughs> I can't tell. It's a little fat fly, maybe. Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> yeah, and I'll put. I give it two two eyes. So this is my bug. Um, maybe let's fill fill this in a little bit. Um, all right. So this is this is my object or my um, little fly that the duck eats. Um, and I want to maybe I want to position it um a different location each time let's see um let's do um let's do random yeah so i can open up my math toolbox drawer grab a pick random block let's do zero to the um screen width and then same thing for the x so you can see x and y are different coordinates on the screen so I'm, I'm just doing a, a random coordinate um, between the, you know, zero, a minimum and a maximum. So between the screen width and the screen height. So every one second, I create a fly 
I set the position of this fly to a random place on the screen. Oh, and of course I need to. And best practice when I teach kids, you should always name your variables a descriptor. I that think that that speaks to uh, one of our uh, one of our live uh, one of our guests said, you know, how do you write clean code and make code? Naming your sprites, I think, is part of that, right? Naming Being your very, sprites, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Very clear in what you so that when you do toggle to the actual code, other person can read your code. That's right. Yeah. So you can see, I've got my ducky. Um, there's a bunch of these flies that are appearing at random locations around the screen. So maybe now let's code something where my ducky can actually eat them. Right. Um, and so to do that, I'm going to open up my sprites toolbox drawer again. I'm going to scroll down to the overlaps category uh, and grab this um, event handler, this overlaps event handler. And um, let's to do this. What this what this block does is it um, it listens for an event where a sprite of a certain kind overlaps another sprite of a certain kind. And right now you can see that my ducky is a kind player and my fly is a kind player. So, but let's change that. Let's change the fly to be um, food, right? And so now we can say when the player character, my ducky, overlaps the fly, which is of kind food, then what should we do? Well, we should probably destroy the fly. So I'm going to grab this destroy my sprite. Um, and the fly that we want to destroy is the specific instance that got overlapped. So to do that, I'm going to grab this local variable here, this other sprite local variable, and drop it in here. Uh, and that will um, that will ensure that the the fly that gets destroyed is the one that we that gets overlapped by the ducky. And then you know you can also add some really cool you know effects and stuff like I don't know Justin, what effects should we add for this? Oh, let's go with confetti. That seems <laughs> okay. Nice. <laughs> nice. Um, and then maybe let's add a sound. Should we add a sound? Maybe, I don't know. Pew, pew. Pew, pew. Okay. <laughs> well, lasers, but for this, we could try. But let's, let's see what we've got so far. So here we've got the flies. Oh, you can see. Do you, do you hear that? I love the confetti. That's awesome. Yeah. And we should probably also add a score, right? So... Maybe we we add we uh, increment our score. So I'm going to open up my info toolbox drawer. I'm going to add change score by one. And this way, when our ducky eats a fly, um, we're we're incrementing our score each time. So and we can also, you know, there's lots of other things we can do here. We can add like um, a timer so that you know you have to eat a certain amount of flies before the end of the time to win, or you know. We can also add like, you know, an enemy maybe that that chases us around. So a lot of different ways we could go with this game. Um, but but just to show you that, you know, with just a few blocks of code, we have like a really compelling, fun game. Um, mm -hmm. So so, yeah, it, you don't have to be like um, a, a, you know, uh, super smart, you know, um, coder person to do something, you know, as, as fun as this. Yeah, totally. You can spend hours in this just creating different variations. And, you know, you started to get a little sophisticated there, Jacqueline, as you, you know, dragged other sprites to other sprites. So you're yeah. basically mapping variables there, which is another core programmer programmers um, practice. Uh, and yeah. so as your code becomes more complicated. This is also teaching some of those more, I'm going to call it intermediate skills um, as you learn to code as well. Yeah, we try um, we try to lead kids down this path without making it super complicated or obvious. So you'll notice we talked about sprite kinds, right? Like the player kind and things. Yep. You know, you could think of this as sort of the beginnings of object-oriented programming in yep. different classes, yep. right? Um, and, and you're right, you know, we do cover scoping a little bit, right? We've got these local variables here, but we don't specifically call them out. You know, I just, when I explain this to students, I just say like, hey, we've got lots of flies on the screen. Which one sh do we want to destroy? You know, it's the one yeah. where that's, that's currently being overlapped, right? Um, so, yeah. 
So yeah, so there we do, you know, we, we try and make it um, simple to understand while still kind of laying the foundation for these more complicated, um, you know, coding concepts. Awesome. Well, we've got about five minutes left. I would love for us to get to the data science part, the, the kind of the experimental project that you have been doing, uh, Jacqueline and others as well. Um, for those of you out there, as you probably are aware, data science is, is really popular right now. And so uh, not only can you program on a micro bit or phys physical hardware or build a game, um, some of the cool things, uh, even my own background, like learning about data science and things like that, we're starting to think about how do you teach introductory data science? So Jacqueline, would you like to show us kind of how yeah. that's and how I just that wanna... in, the code blocking and things like that too? Yes, totally. I just want to set expectations that this is a, an experiment. So as I mentioned before, MakeCode is open source. Uh, and so we've got a lot of editors that um, folks have made that are kind of more experimental editors is what I would say. Uh, and so that's in our uh, labs page. You can kind of see what people have built and the different um, editors here. But but what you were talking about, Justin, is this data science editor. Again, it is experimental uh, at this point, but we know that more and more um, uh, teachers are trying to incorporate data science uh, into their curriculum because obviously data science is this huge field and we need to start teaching uh, teaching students about this earlier. And so this is a way that we have been kind of experimenting around combining you know, computational thinking and learning about computer science with, with data science earlier on. And so this is a, an editor we created. You know, you can create, uh, we've got two built-in data sets, but you know, you can also uh, load a data set from a file um, as well. And we have different blocks that, that you know, students can, can use to, you know, um, select different fields. So if I'm going to sort uh, the fiber by ascending, and then we've got this little little eyeball thing. So at any nice. point, uh, students can kind of see what the data set looks like, right? Um, so this is the before picture of the data set. This is after we've done, done a sort by fiber. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and then we have, you know, computational blocks. So you can compute columns. Um, uh, we've got some some statistics blocks. Um, we've got some cool charts. Um, so let's do maybe a bar chart um, to show you. Uh, let's see. Maybe that's not not working. Maybe a scatter plot. Um, so, but again, I, I would say this is hmm, experimental. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, not everything you know works exactly, but um, but we are starting to do a little bit of user testing around um, you know how teachers might actually use this um, in mm -hmm. the classroom and what kind of projects they want um, a tool like this to to support in terms of teaching data science. So if you are listening and are interested in you know, getting it more involved with teaching data science, um, please play around with this editor and give us feedback. We, you know, we definitely want to hear back from, especially if um, you are an educator or, uh, or know of educators, um, we were definitely open to feedback on, you know, what we could do to create a really nice tool um, that, you know, combines both computer science and data science in teaching kids about, you know, about data. Very cool. Yeah. And um, wait, I'll switch over to slides here. When I was prepping for this live stream, I did a quick one of these with the data science editor and just did a linear regression of protein and fat. Obviously, there's like oh, yeah. clearly a correlation between protein and fat. Not all things. I've been trying to eat more healthy with uh, you know nuts and uh, leaner proteins and things like that. But you can even calculate things like that with the, the data set um, as well. Uh, Jacqueline, there's a question from Learn uh, TV. Uh, where do we subscribe or join your weekday uh, series? That 1 p.m. one that you mentioned. How, oh, how can yeah. we get a hold of you or know what to get that? Yeah, it's just on Twitch. So let me just copy the link in here. Um, so it's just on Twitch, make code. Um, yeah. Uh, 1 p.m. Monday through Friday, uh, 1 p.m. Pacific. Yeah. Very cool. 
All right. Well, we are at the top of the hour. We burned an hour super fast as we often do, Jacqueline. It's just a pleasure to work with you and, and to share um, what we're doing with Make Code and things like that. So thank you so much uh, for sharing uh, your work and the team's work uh, that you do uh, as well. Uh, for all y'all out there, certainly check out Make Code. It's a great place to begin, whether you're a student or adult. I, I absolutely experiment with it myself. Um, I mentioned some other resources last week. If you want to step up to the next kind of level, uh, we have a Python for Beginners course on Microsoft Learn that's great. Uh, and I also mentioned some really interesting curriculum last week, which I'll mention this week that it's relevant to Farm Beats for students and IoT for uh, beginners. Uh, but then please join us uh, for uh, next week. Uh, we're going to talk and continue this sort of career building series uh, with a uh, CS degree versus coding boot camp. Uh, versus credentials, right? Really kind of evaluating what's the best way or what are some, one of many ways uh, to go and technically upskill. There's really no right answer. It's about just sharing that difference um, as well. So again, thank you, Jacqueline, and thank you all and have a great day. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Bye, everyone. <laughs>